Hello, everyone. It's not what you think it is, indeed. This is Max Verstappen. <laughs> Formula One driver, three times world champion, Red Bull racing team. And to me, Max Verstappen represents the most precious assets of a tech company. Engineers. Engineers have the unique ability in tech organizations to create so-called 10x impact with their, with, their, with their ability, with their work. Quite the task, quite the expectation, right? They need help. Meet Hannah Smits. Hannah Smits is a key person behind the success of the Red Bull Racing team. By the way, Hannah is a real person. Please look her up, Hannah Smits. I couldn't find any royalty-free image of her on the internet, so Gen AI helped out here. Now, she's the principal strategist of the Raspberry Racing team. She advises Max on risky takeover moves, on understanding how the weather might influence the race. Um, she is responsible for building a tire management strategy. In other words, she needs to make sure that Max wins. Now, to me, Hannah right here very much represents this crowd right here. Just like Hannah, product managers like you and myself, we need to make sure that the Maxes in our organization that their impact is maximized. Today, we're going to talk about this dynamic, the di dynamic between Max and Hannah in our organizations in the setting of tech companies. I'm going to zoom in on this, this relationship between product and engineering. And I look very much forward to sharing some of my personal stories in trying to get the most out of this unique relationship. But like with any relationship, right, there is unfortunately no silver bullet to success. No silver bullet to success. Instead, I hope that my talk, it contains some elements that are recognizable in your organization, maybe actionable, and who knows, maybe the relationship gets much better. This is the context in which we needed relationship counseling. Today, I'll introduce you to the complex world of payments. I'm gonna, we're gonna discuss the flow and how a payment flows for our payments platform. And also, I'll hopefully be able to show you what tremendous value machine learning can unlock in this particular setting. And this is my role at the company called Agen. My teams and I, we are responsible for building products that leverage machine learning to provide shoppers like you and I with a seamless journey when paying. While we also have to make sure that our customers, merchants, are protected from fraud and other risks. So Agen is a financial technology platform. Um, we provide uh, payments on a global scale in online environments, but also offline uh, in store with, um, uh, with physical terminals. And besides that, in the realm of financial services, we build many more products. Think uh, cash advances, loans, business bank accounts, cards, you name it. And what's very cool about financial products is that data is either the perfect fuel for skill or the perfect optimization layer. And to give you a sense of that skill, last year we processed over $1 trillion for our platform, for our merchants. And these merchants, they have expectations. They expect that shoppers like you and I, that we have this, this fast, happy, beautiful, uninterrupted flow when paying at one, of their, at one of their stores. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't always go according to plan may be recognizable even to some of you. 9% of good shoppers, they, they can check out. They, they experience inefficiencies in the payment flow. This can be the fact that you can select your local payment method, your favorite local payment method. Or you might get flagged accidentally or classified as a malicious user, as a fraudster, blocking you from transacting. Or you might get caught up in some legacy that unfortunately very much still exists in the complex global infrastructure in the financial world. This is what my teams and I try to solve for on a daily basis. Now, this is the payment flow from left to right. On the very left, you find this checkout box. So this is the UI, the environment in which you select your favorite payment method. You leave some personal details. And from there, we activate the risk checks, the risk box right there. In the risk box, we need to determine, are we dealing right here with a malicious attempt, with a fraudster? Fraud has always been a very complicated problem in the financial industry, but especially now, thanks to the rise of uh, global e-commerce, the advancements in Gen AI, as Joe picked, uh, pointed out, <clears throat> these advancements, but also the fact that you can now open up bank accounts in a matter of minutes online. You don't have to show up at a bank anymore physically. That made this a very hard problem to solve for. Then we have the authentication layer that applies to some payments. 
And in the authentication layer, I'm referring to technologies that try and determine is the user of this particular payment instrument, for example, a card, is it also the owner of that payment method? So here, uh, for example, Face ID on the iPhone or uh, at SMS text when you're buying your flight ticket, those are uh, authentication mechanisms that we use, very much linked to this fraud and risk box too. Now, if everything is all right in those boxes, we move to the first attempt stage. So we built up this massive transaction message based on all the information we've derived from all these steps, but also business model information, the channel, uh, all the context, all the technical context we can find, and we sent this to one of the networks to Visa, MasterCard, American Express, local payment method. And we're hoping that these networks forward it correctly to your bank, the, card, the, the bank that gave you your card, and we're hoping for an authorization response. With this authorization, we can tell the merchant, you're good to go, please provide the goods and services. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't always go according to plan, as we've seen before. There may be insufficient balance uh, on the bank account. It might be the case that the, your bank still thinks it's fishy despite our checks. Or maybe there's some network errors, as we pointed out before. Now, the teams that, we work, that I work with, we're all trying to make sure that we make the right decision, the right complex decision in every box for every individual payment that flows for a system. What's very hard about this problem is that this needs to happen in a so-called low latency environment, in real time. When you're booking your, your taxi with your favorite ride-hailing app at midnight, or paying for your groceries, you and I as shoppers have you know, the expectation that this goes blazingly fast. Also, all these teams, yeah, there we are. All these teams, they're, they're trying to optimize in their particular setting, right? In the checkout box, the team is trying to leverage UI, to play around with the UI, to nudge you into conversion. Well, in the risk box, it's all about finding that equilibrium between risking fraud versus risking blocking a good shopper. In the second attempt stage, it's all about calculating the probability of a successful retry, right? We can maybe play around with, uh, with the transaction messages I've been talking about. Maybe we can get a successful authorization, but you also have to take into account dimensions such as additional payment cost, for example. Now, to solve for all of this complexity at an enormous scale, we've introduced machine learning algorithms over, over, over the years. Massive investment from our side. And you can imagine with all the fraud cases that we've seen in the past, right? All this labeled data, but also the preferences from all the banks in the world. We use all that information right now together with all the real-time events flowing for a system to make the right decision at each particular stage in the payment funnel. Now, to give you a sense of scale, I'm talking about more than a thousand requests per second going through this particular part of our payments platform. We already, I shared something around quickness, right? All these models, they need to come to their conclusions in less than 100 milliseconds. And this accumulates to over 300 billion requests per year flowing through this particular part of the payments platform. But the investment, it's all worth it. You know, referring to that trillion dollar amount, basis points count in this, uh, in this business case. And by the way, I also think this is just a very cool ML, like a very cool problem to solve with ML, you can imagine. So now we've established a business case. Um, I hope I shared the why behind machine learning in this particular setting. And I would like to go back to the relationship between product and engineering, the dynamic between Hannah and Max. Because you can imagine that in order to solve for all this complexity, we need, these, we need those super Maxes, right? We need those top engineers that solve for this, and they need to be guided by Hannah. What I'll do, I'll share some manifestations of how this went wrong on our side, actually. And hopefully I'll also be able to share some fixes with you, fixes we've now applied in our relationship after some proper counseling to now benefit from a better relationship and make sure that the maxes in our environment have more impact. First up, goals and prioritization. Now, a while ago, this was our situation. All the teams working on this payment flow optimization, they were represented in our objectives and key results, goal setting methodology. Also, according to textbook, we defined a North Star metric, right? Like a metric that all teams hopefully can link towards to, and it perfectly represents the value that we create for customers and everyone happy. Unfortunately, we chose a very complex North Star metric. Now, engineers got frustrated. They got caught up in their own complexity, much more focused on perfect measurements rather than quick iterations, not getting the guidance from product managers they need isolated teams, isolated individuals, isolated features. 
with so many OKRs and a complex North Star metric, engineering teams, product teams, started very much working in isolation using local success metrics. Today, we only work with three OKRs. And the key to this has been prioritization. I'm sure you talk a lot about prioritization. Now, a classic way of putting this is that prioritization must truly hurt. And this might, might sound easy, but in my experience, and I think this is only human, we want to make sure that every previous investment, every product, every project, every initiative somehow ends up on planning. We want to make sure that every individual, every team, every role, every function can identify itself in KPIs or in OKRs. Don't. Prioritization must hurt, truly. The good news is, is that your engineers, they will love you for the fact that you're doing this ruthless prioritization. You will reduce complexity. And as a result, these engineering teams it will become so much easier to measure success. And it will become so much easier for an engineer to understand how they contribute to the big picture. Product first thinking. Second up, ways of working. Again, previous situation. We had in the teams working on this particular problem domain, in this problem domain, we had a ratio of 1 p.m. for every six engineers. And also, we were falling for the trap where PMs get caught up in way too much project management and stakeholder management work. The problem about this is that this creates high coordination costs within your organization. And trust me, the maxes of this world, they don't like meetings. We don't like meetings. Imagine engineers. Fluff work, unrelated decks flying around, this doesn't help. And it only creates isolated thinking, isolated features. Today, we're looking at a 1 to 8 PM to engineers ratio, and I personally think we should go even more up, maybe to 1 to 10. Now, we've given product managers much more scope, much more. The great thing is, is that this scope naturally created product first thinking. Let me give you an example. In the previous setup, we had four PMs looking after four different models. And when you ask smart people to go for something, they'll find ways to identify new use cases, additional value, more research, more applications. But again, this results in four disjointed features. Today, we have 1 p.m. looking after four models, these four models. And all the work that's being put in in, put in, in one particular model, hypothesis testing, uh, monitoring systems, you'll name it, all that work is now being extrapolated to, all the, to, the, to the rest of the models. And not only are, interf are, are our engineers happy that there is just one person to interface with, it, it also naturally created a guardian of the story of these four models. This PM is now much better equipped, much more able to translate all this ML complexity to the commercial organization. Also, we did some proper counseling, tech leads in the room, PMs in the room together, and we decided let's shift ticket assignments, sprint planning, all that project management stuff, let's shift it to the tech leads, not the PM anymore. For us, this worked. Tech leads feel much more in control. They can much better anticipate the pressure and the workloads on their teams. While the PMs are now freed up to do meaningful PM work, writing customer-inspired PRDs and roadmaps. And last but not least, Product-first thinking allows you to land a product instead of launching a product. And let me explain this with an analogy I have from, uh, from a colleague, actually. When you are launching a rocket, liftoff of the ground, that doesn't define success. You're trying to land it, connect it to the International Space Station, landing it on the moon, landing it on Mars. And the point I want to make is that only with product-first thinking, you'll be able to set out a logical steps a logical plan for the go-to-market. Only with product-first thinking, you can optimize the product operations that will definitely follow a launch. When you launch isolated features, all you do is increase coordination work, and you'll create, create massive, unplannable overheads for engineers. And then we have impact. An impact I can best illustrate with an example, I think, because something very interesting happens when we applied product-first thinking in this particular domain, we unlocked value that was always right in front of us. All we had to do is apply this way of thinking. 
Remember the payment flow um, we discussed before together? I copied over three particular stages right here. And we've determined now, now together that these local success metrics, right, this isolate, isolated features thinking, that's not the way to go. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure ML teams, they'll always have their own statistics, their own ways to evaluate if effects and impacts. But there needs to be some global success metric, a simple one, that interconnects all of this complexity. In our case, it has become the full funnel conversion rate. It's a simple metric all these ML models can understand, can build for. And moreover, very important, this is a metric that's also very close to the customer world. This is a metric that they'll understand even better than us sometimes. So now we have this global success metric. Um, we have fixed the relationship between product and engineering, right? We've applied all these fixes in ways of working and, and prioritization. And we can stop thinking about this payment flow in sequential steps. Because remember, when I explained the product flow, the, the, the funnel, the payment funnel, I went through it black box for black box for black box. Let's look at it holistically right now as a whole, product first thinking. It turns out that when we use the information, the output of the risk model, as input for the authentication model, that's a total game changer. Transactions where the risk model is not sure what to do, and this happens, right? You're not sure if it's fraud, you're not sure if it's a good shopper, yeah, what do I do? We now use the authentication layer dynamically using ML much more intelligently to try and create extra assurance. Well, in the isolated setup, the risk model by itself in isolation might have thought, you know what, I'm going to be on the safe side. I'm going to block this transaction, risking blocking good shoppers. Also, we use the conclusion of the authentication model right now and apply that conclusion in the first attempt stage. When you have an authenticated payment, that's the most clean payment there is. Like you, you, it's guaranteed, right? Face ID, sure, there can be some fraud, but very little. Face ID is a very strong mechanism. That means that in the first attempt stage, we can be extremely aggressive with all the risky optimizations that might follow in my world. And lastly, using the risk-informed data points that our risk model generated, even though we know it's a good customer, it's, it's any of you just transacting, Using that and making that available to the partner banks we're connecting in the first attempt stage, it increased that full funnel conversion rate. Simple wins. So I want to show here that by getting rid of this isolated feature thinking, we unlocked value that was always right here in front of us. And again, this might sound simple, it might look simple, but from a technical perspective, we were not set up for this success. And also from an organizational structure, the dynamic, the relationship between Max and Hannah and the way we've organized our product team, this was not achievable, and now it is. In that previous setup, in that previous setup, we were thinking in isolated ML problems, right? And these models in that same funnel, they might show greedy behavior. They might not care too much what happens down the funnel. Our teams were using local success metrics. Well, they were all working in the same product problem domain, not the right approach. Even worse, and frustratingly, I think everyone involved experienced something very fragmented, right? Not understanding how their piece of the puzzle, we're talking about very large teams, not understanding how they contribute to the big picture. Worse, even, is that it becomes very hard to translate all of this complexity to the commercial organization. Well, it's so valuable, right? The commercial organization needs to be equipped with simple ways of explaining all this complexity that we've just discussed. Today, we have a unified offering. And by embracing product-first thinking, we got rid of this lots of complexity, right? We got rid of what we had in our organization, sometimes hyper-focus on very particular optimizations in the payment flow, only distracting and taking up way too many resources. And we unlocked value that was always right there in front of us. And not only have our customers now an increase in this full vulnerable conversion rate, right, in value that we eventually have to create for them, they'll experience this too. Remember the black sequential boxes? In our previous, like in our previous setup, we had in our customer area, for each black box, a way to explain that part of the story. Because every part of the story had its own uh, success metrics, its own statistics. Again, a fragmented experience for customers. I think you've guessed it right, today, very simple, we're trying to bring this all together into one view. One simple way to demonstrate that top value. And not only is this way easier for customers to interpret, right, instead of trying to bring all these stories together, how does risk influence first attempt and all that stuff, it's now just much easier to all bring them back, bring, bring them back together. 
And besides customers, engineers love this too. It has become much easier right now for an engineer to understand how do I contribute, not only to the big picture, but to the customer impact, and not just to my individual black box. So while it might look impossible or um, very, very hard or challenging, and this can be due to your culture, size of your organization, uh, existing complexity in your product suite, ways of working, caught up engineers. I hope that my story, that it provides actual evidence that you are able to reduce complexity. It is possible in a very large organization to go back from 21 OKRs to three OKRs. Do get in a room together with the maxes in your organization, with your engineers, and discuss, is there project management work that we can shift back to the engineering team simply because it comes very natural to them? You save coordination costs and meetings. We can give product managers much more scope, trust me. And with that scope, they'll create naturally this product-first thinking benefits the customer. And it is possible to hook up three ML models together, while it might look very difficult, right, in this demanding, low-latency environment, it is possible if you embrace product-first thinking. So just like Hannah, get together, put your heads together with the Maxis in your organization tomorrow. Product is a team sport. Challenge complexity together, get rid of, get rid of isolated features thinking, and start maximizing your impacts with product-first thinking. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all the very best on your product journey.